During this series, we are looking at the prophetic portion of scripture, Isaiah 62, that God gave to our church six years ago when we stepped out to plant the Father's house. And uh, if you were not here last weekend, let me strongly encourage you to go back, take a listen, or watch the YouTube for that sermon. I really do help, uh, think it'll help you frame in everything that we're going to discuss in the weeks ahead. But I also think it'll help you wrap your faith around all of the promises that God has given to our church and to our city through Isaiah 62. Uh, those promises as we mentioned last weekend, come in the form of a prayer that the prophet Isaiah offers up on behalf of the Israelite people. Uh, they are, as David mentioned a moment ago in our giving exhortation, they are going to be brought into Babylon for captivity for 70 years as a result of their disobedience to God. But Isaiah prophesies of a time where they will return to the desolate city of Jerusalem and everything will begin to change. Uh, specifically, he begins to speak about the, the positive future that is available to the people of God and the promises that God has made to them. Uh, the first of those promises that we looked at last week was in our title text, Isaiah 62.10, where he says, uh, prepare the way, remove the stones, get the rocks out of the road so that my people can return to me. And we talked about this promise of salvation that God has made to our city. How many believe that revival is still coming to San Francisco, that he's not done with our city. There's more he's going to do. And we are not the only church. There are many preaching the gospel, and there will be a move of God through all the churches in our city before my watch is done here. And I really do believe that an end times harvest is coming to San Francisco. Uh, so we talked about that promise last week, and then our role in that promise is to prepare the way, specifically to remove the stones, namely the stone of shame that so many people trip over on their way coming back home to Jesus. Uh, today, as we enter into the second installment of this series, we're going to look at yet another promise that is mentioned in Isaiah 62, and uh, one that is a major theme within this chapter, also one of my favorite subjects to discuss anytime I get an opportunity to preach, because I know that if we get this one right, it will absolutely transform the way we live our lives, and that is the subject of identity. Today, we're talking about identity. Uh, our culture, I don't think this would be a surprise to anybody, but our culture is obsessed with identity. It, it is the primary conversation our day and age, whether it's your social identity, your ethnic identity, your political identity, your sexual identity, your gender identity. There's a lot of conversations happening around the subject of identity. But, but while it is a, a major cultural conversation, it's also a major scriptural conversation. It, it is mentioned all throughout the Bible, both Old and New Testament. Jesus, even in his teachings, he covered the subject quite a bit. In fact, at the, at the beginning of this year, in the late spring, we did a five-part series called Who Am I? where we looked at the statements Jesus makes about our identity. You are the salt of the earth. You, you are the light of the world. And we concluded on Pentecost Sunday when we talked about you are filled with, sorry, I just had to get that out of my system. You are filled with power. Uh, but among the, uh, the, the many statements in Scripture made about identity is this chapter, chapter Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 62. Uh, this is a major theme within our, our text for the coming weeks. And, and today what I'd like to do is, is look at all, uh, all of the identity statements identified here in the text. In fact, it's 25% of the chapter, but it's found in three of the verses. Two of them are found at the beginning of Isaiah 62, where Isaiah says this. And San Francisco, by the way, just so you know, that's not what is really written in the Bible, <laughs> just to be clear. We talked about it last week. You'll have to go back and listen to understand. But if you're like, my translation says something else, don't worry about it. It's fine. <laughs> and San Francisco will be given a new name by the Lord's own mouth. Never again will you be called the forsaken city or the desolate land. Your new name will be the city of God's delight and the bride of God. Later on in the chapter, he says in verse 12, uh, they will be called the holy people, the people redeemed by the Lord. And San Francisco will be known as sought out and a city no longer forsaken. That's a good word right there. So a lot of names mentioned in that text uh, as we enter into this subject. But what I'd like to do is look at these two words that Isaiah uses in the second and fourth verse and title this, uh, this sermon today as follows. I want to call this new name, new name. Oh, I liked all the little heads that just went down to write. Thank you for taking notes. Good job. It is statistically proven. If you take notes, you go to heaven. That's how it works, all right? It's not true. Might help, just throwing it out there. 
New Name. By the way, we also wrote a song called New Name, so if you are interested in checking that out, you can catch it on all the streaming platforms as well. Let's pray. Uh, Holy Spirit, speak to us today as we go to your word. Thank you for this prophetic passage of scripture that you've given to the Father's house and you've given to the city of San Francisco. As we uh, broach the subject of identity, a, a very popular one in our culture, God, we just consciously right now take a moment, we lay aside all the narratives, we lay aside all of the, the voices, uh, the things that culture tells us we're supposed to identify with, and instead, we pick up the word of God today, we look at what it says about us, and God, we ask that you would transform the way we think so that you can transform the way we live before we leave this place this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I apologize in advance if what I'm about to say is repeat for some in the room. Um, we have made this statement many times from the stage, even as recently as that series I mentioned a moment ago. But uh, I know that God has added a few hundred people to our community since the late spring. And so there is, in fact, a, a group of people here that have never heard us say this before. And thus, I offer our thesis on identity once again. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. Here's what we believe. You will live according to your perceived identity. You will live according to your perceived identity. In other words, your actions are the byproduct of the way you see yourself. The way you think about you determines how you live your life. If you believe that you are forsaken, unforgiven, that you're a failure, you're unworthy of love or affection, if you believe what broken people say about you or what your broken past says about you or the narrative of your broken culture, how it defines you, if you believe those things, rest assured, you will live according to that perceived identity. Your life will be a downward spiral of self-fulfilling prophecy where you will live ashamed, unfulfilled, because ultimately that's who you think you are. However, on the other side of that coin, if you recognize what your creator says about you, if you identify with the word of God, if you believe that you are loved, that you are forgiven, that you are blessed and highly favored, that you are above and not beneath, that you are the head and not the tail, that you are the lender and not the borrower, that you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus, that you are kings and priests and heirs to an eternal inheritance. Come on, if you believe these things, then you will live your life according to that belief. Ultimately, our actions are the byproduct of the way we see ourselves. And so when God wants to change somebody's life, he starts by changing their identity. He understands that in order for us to live differently, we need to see ourselves differently. Namely, we need to see ourselves the way that God sees us. And this is precisely how Isaiah starts this prayer out. Before he begins to speak about any of the things the people of God are going to do, he tells them who they are. He starts with identity. And this probably doesn't need to be said, but I'm going to say it anyway, just, just so that we're all on the same page. This new name that Isaiah speaks of, it's not for a city, it's for the people of the city. It's for the individuals within that city. This is not like some branding campaign. He's like, you know, I don't like Jerusalem anymore. Let's go with something new. No, Jerusalem will always be known as Jerusalem. San Francisco will always be known as San Francisco or the city or Frisco or for the outsiders that makes me cringe, San Fran. I'm like, ooh, that, don't ever say that. Please stop. I heard so many people say that this week. I was at an event with some other pastors. I'm like, you, you don't know what you're talking. I'm going to backhand you. It reminds me of Fran Drescher from The Nanny. Every time someone says that, like, you're in San Fran. I'm like, ah, oh, stop. Sorry, rabbit trail. But that's not what God's talking about here. He's not going to try to rebrand the city. Ultimately, a city is is an inanimate entity. It doesn't have an identity, but the identity of its people. And thus, if God wants to change the nature of a city, he needs to change the name of the people. And since this is a prophetic portion of scripture for us, then we can cling to this promise. God did not just give them a new name, he's given us a new name. He's spoken fresh identity over all of us. But as Isaiah begins to show us here, in order to lay hold of that new name, there are some old names and some old labels that we need to take a moment and address. And to aid us in that process, we've got a graphic here that I want us to look at for the next couple of moments. There are two you are not statements in this text and five you are statements in this text. Isaiah makes it clear this is not who you are anymore. You are not forsaken. 
God has not turned his back on you. He's not done with you. Yes, there was an area of correction that needed to be addressed, but you've not been forsaken. And you are no longer desolate, empty, and hopeless. There is still hope for your future. Yeah, things might not look very good right now, but this is not who you are. Who you truly are is sought after. You are that one little lamb out there in the wilderness that Jesus chased down and left the 99 for. And when he found you, he redeemed you. Translation, he bought you back. Like Gomer on the auction block. He said, I don't care what you've done. I'm going to pay the price to bring you unto myself. Not only did he buy you back, he said, you are my bride now. We're going to spend a lot of time on that word in another week in this series because it's mentioned a number of times in Isaiah 62. But like a bride to a groom, we've been brought together with God. You are holy, set apart, not because of your actions, but because I've touched your life. And whatever I touch, I make holy. And you are, yes, my delight. This is who you truly are. You are not these things, but you are these things. I I find those two on the left column relatively significant. You are not forsaken. You are not hopeless. I find them significant even in this text because here now thousands of years later, I feel like that is ultimately how the majority of humanity defines itself. Hopeless and forsaken. If you were to categorize the broken plot of humanity and dump all of it into one of two buckets, those are the two buckets we'd find. Pain, suffering, depravity, inequity, wars, go down the list, broken relationships, they all fall into one of those two categories, forsaken or hopeless. In fact, I'm not naive to the fact that there are probably people sitting in the room today who would define your own life that way. As you consider the landscape of your life and all that you've faced and all that you're walking through right now, your circumstances, you might say, things feel a little bit hopeless and it feels like God might have turned his back on me. I feel forsaken. But here is what I love about God. Here's what I love about this text and I love about this promise. God says, when you see forsaken and hopeless, I say something else. You might see depravity, but I say sought after, I say redeemed, I say the bride of God, I say holy, and I say I still delight in my people. This is what you see but I'm going to say something else. Which, honestly, at face value, when you consider the context of this story, it, it, it kind of feels a little bit like a slap in the face, doesn't it? Like, imagine this for a moment. You come up to somebody who's in the midst of financial depravity, and you're like, you're blessed. And they're like, no, I'm not. Or you come up to a woman who maybe just lost her husband through divorce or through death, and you're like, you're just the bride. It feels painful, right? At the risk of being careless with my words, but in consideration of the context of the text here, imagine walking up to somebody who is currently enslaved, being beaten by a master and saying, you've been redeemed, you're emancipated. Meanwhile, they're continuing to be subjected to the whim of the master in slavery, not only does it directly contrast their current circumstance, but it feels like a bit of a slap in the face, doesn't it? But but here's what I recognize when I look at this text. When, When I see these two columns contrasted with each other, it tells me something about identity. It tells me that our new identity often contradicts our present reality. In other words, God tells you who you are before you are. Your new name, it may not look like it yet, but God speaks it even into the contradiction. He says, I know things don't look the way that I'm saying, but I'm gonna speak this out anyway. Remember who this was written to in the first place. This was written to a group of people who were not experiencing this reality yet. They were currently at war. The the, the nations were were coming against them. They had turned their back on God. Isaiah is prophesying about events that are going to take place in the future. You will be carried off into Babylon. You'll be a people that leaves a desolate city. And yet into the contradiction, God says, I know things are going to look hopeless and forsaken, but I'm going to say something else. 
I'm going to speak into the contradiction and declare what you will become. Why? Why does God do this? Why, as Paul says in Romans 4, 17, does God call things that are not as though they are? Is it to bait us? To, 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 to dangle a carrot? To, to put salt in the wound? Is that No, that's not the character of God. Let me tell you why God speaks into the contradiction. God speaks into contradictions because he knows that the moment he opens his mouth, the contradiction resolves. He knows that his words possess creative power. In other words, when God opens his mouth and he begins to speak, realities that did not exist before suddenly come into being. Oh, come on. We're going to preach here for a couple minutes, all right? How did God create the earth? He spoke it into existence. He opened up his mouth and he declared some things into the abyss. Genesis 1 says that the earth was formless and void and that darkness hovered over the waters. If you want to borrow Isaiah's language, things looked hopeless and they looked forsaken. But into the hopeless and forsaken abyss, the Lord spoke and he said, let there be light and light appeared. Let there be a distinction between the land and the waters and the waters took up their boundaries. Let there be life and all created beings came to existence. Why? Because God spoke them into existence. He opened up his mouth and realities that did not exist before suddenly began to exist. He spoke it into existence. And so when God speaks over your life, it doesn't matter how hopeless things might look. When he begins to speak a new name, everything that anyone else said about you or your circumstance says about you must bow down to the sound of his voice. This is why Isaiah says in the second verse of Isaiah 62, you have been given a new name by what? By the Lord's own mouth. This is not some positive confession. This is not looking yourself in the mirror and in the morning and saying, I'm smart enough, I'm good enough, and doggone it, people like me. Shout out to the older people who understood that reference. No, this is not you trying to make yourself feel better about yourself. This is a declaration from the mouth of the one who created the heavens and the earth with the sound of his voice. Come on, the one who speaks and splits the mighty cedars. The one who speaks and twists the oak. The one who told the waters where to stop and then spoke to those same waters on the Sea of Galilee and said, Be still, and the waters had to calm at the sound of his voice. He's the one who speaks over your life. So I don't care what your circumstance says. I don't care what your past says. I don't care what your broken uncle says. I don't care what your spouse says about you sometimes. I don't care what your urges say about you or what your failures say about you. You have been given a new name from the mouth of the one who created the heavens and the earth, and he declares you are sought after, you are holy, you are betrothed, you are mine. That's what... He says about us. And yeah, woo! It gets us all excited and we clap and it's 100% true, just to be clear. But while it's good and true, why is it then that we seem to struggle so much in this area of identity? Why do we seem to have a much easier time placing ourselves in the left column among the broken things? than placing ourselves in the right call among the things that we truly are. What is that about us? Maybe it's just human nature, the the nature of broken humanity. It's a whole lot easier to resonate with our brokenness than the things that God says. Maybe it's our environments, the places we subject ourselves to that echo all the things we don't like about ourselves. Or maybe it's just that we have a really good memory of our sin and we really have a poor job of memorizing the scriptures to combat those things. It's a lot of things, but if I could diagnose it today, I would say I think one of the primary reasons we have such a challenging time identifying with those new names is because we're still responding to some of the old names. Uh, I'm gonna date myself with this reference and perhaps discredit myself at the same time, but it's a great, it's a great reference, so I'm going to use it anyway. Uh, there was a movie that came out when I was a kid called Joe Dirt. <laughs> a 
by the laugh. Some of you remember that movie. It's probably wildly inappropriate. I don't suggest you go home and watch it after church, but I have a core memory from this movie that I was thinking about as I wrote this, this sermon this week. But, but in the movie, uh, Joe Dirt, who was played by David Spade, uh, he comes to this security gate, and he's in kind of his jalopy car, and, and uh, he looks up, and there's a, a guy guarding the security gate, and this security guard has known him since he was younger, and uh, so even as he pulls up, though the guy knows him, he's like, I need to see your ID to get through the gate, and he's like, I got my ID right here, sir, and he pulls out his ID, and he says, here I am, Joe Dierte. And the security guard looks back at this guy he's known for a very long time. He says, don't try to church it up, boy. Everybody knows your name is Joe Dirt. An iconic line, a cinematic line for all time in history. But as I was thinking about that line, I'm like, that's, if we're not careful, that's how many of us can begin to respond to a message like this. We're over here talking about all the new names that God has given to us, and meanwhile, there's this nagging little voice in the back of our head saying, don't try to church it up. You know who you really are. Let me call you by your real name. (laughs) You're an addict, you're not free. You're condemned, you're not forgiven. Don't try to pretend like you're healed, you ain't healed, you're still sick. And this holy and righteous stuff that you're talking about, I'm sorry. We both know what you did, so quit trying to church up your life. Quit trying to let that preacher up up there tell you you're better than you are. We both know who you truly are. But if I could offer some advice, when you hear that voice, when the old names are hurled at you, let me just remind you, you are under no obligation to respond. You don't have to go when they call. You don't have to resonate with what they say. You don't even need to respond. I don't know when this happened, but, um, or excuse me, why this happened, but a couple of months ago, my youngest daughter, she started calling me by my full name. So we'd be in public settings somewhere and she'd walk up and she'd say, hi, Timothy Irving Biddle. And, and yes, Irving is my middle name. Feel free to use it. I'll help you find another church afterwards. Uh, <laughs> that's not a joke. Uh, so she kept calling me by my full name. And, and you know, first I'm like, oh, how funny. And then I'm like, this is, this is not okay. This is annoying. That's my government name. That's not the name you get to talk to me about. So, so I pulled her aside. I said, hey, sweetheart, just to be clear, I'm your dad, all right? So, so you can call me dad. You can call me daddy. You can call me daddy-o. You can call me big papa. Uh, if, you, <laughs> if you want to refer to me as something different at church, uh, I'll even permit Father Tim. That will work, all right? But... But <laughs> Timothy Irving Biddle is just not going to work for me. Uh, unfortunately, rebellion is strong in that one. Um, I blame her mother. And so she continued. <laughs> she continued to call me by my full name. And so I did the mature adult thing. I just started ignoring her. I haven't paid attention to that kid in three months. I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, anytime she would come to my office after school and she'd walk up and she'd say, hi, Timothy Irving Biddle, I just, I wouldn't even pick up my head. I refused to respond because that's not the name I want her to call me. Now, all analogies break down at some point, and this one does pretty quickly because obviously my name is Timothy Irving Biddle. So, uh, yeah, I get it. But you get the point. You are under no obligation to respond. If you don't like the name, if it's not the new one God's given to you, you don't even have to pick up your head. You don't gotta respond. Even if it resonates with your current circumstance, you serve a God that speaks a different circumstance over your life, and so you don't have to respond because your God calls those things that are not as though they are. So yes, you might be struggling with addiction, but addict is not your identity because Jesus said in Luke chapter nine, I've come to set every captive free. You might be struggling with sickness in your body, but your brokenness is not your identity because Isaiah 53 says that you've been healed by the stripes of Jesus. You may not feel holy and you may not feel righteous, but good news, Romans 3 said it has nothing to do with your feelings and everything to do with your faith in the finished work of the cross, and Jesus still declares that you are righteous. And you might have a keen memory of your sin, but sunshine, he does not. 
Psalm 103 says he's removed your sin as far as the east is from the west. Isaiah says he's made you white as snow. He has cast your sin into the sea, never to be remembered. Again, so you are under no obligation to respond to the broken names that are spoken about you. Man, if I was a Pentecostal preacher, this is where I'd take out a phone and I'd say, when the enemy calls, you can send him to voicemail and you can give him the text instead. Hallelujah. You're cheering. My wife is laughing at me. That's awesome. All right. Take that out for the next service. Okay. <laughs> so, so here's the deal. Let me ask you this question. You know, you know that we love to do that around here. The, the question that forces you to wrestle with all we've talked about up until this point. Let me, let me ask you. In light of that, what names do you need to stop responding to? What call do you need to send a voicemail? What old label are you allowing to stick to you when it shouldn't any longer? Because God's given you a new name. What, what are those broken things in the left column that you need to say, that's not me anymore. I'm not responding to that. No, I resonate with what's in the right column. And while we're on that subject, let's just go and talk about our city for a moment, shall we? In the same way that you do not have to respond to the old labels that people place on you or the enemy places on you, we don't have to resonate with the broken labels that faithless people place on our city. I remember when we were first coming to plant the church, some, uh, some well-meaning people, faithless people, offered their unsolicited opinion about our decisions. And I heard over and over again things like, San Francisco? That's where churches go to die. It's a spiritual wasteland out there. Why, why would you go all the way out there and try to plant a church in a city that wants nothing to do with God? They're poised for judgment. The next earthquake's gonna sweep them out to the sea. Everyone else is gonna get beachfront property after San Francisco disappears. I had one guy come up to me, bold-faced, look me in the eyes and say, I have a prophetic word for you. The Lord said that if you go to San Francisco that your kids are gonna be the casualty. They're gonna fall prey to the culture of the city, essentially suggesting that coming here was like sending my kids to hell, which made me wanna tell the guy where I'd like him to go. But I was a <laughs> aspiring lead pastor, and so I didn't say those things. <laughs> but clearly, that's not what God says about our city. Those are not the words that have come from his mouth over San Francisco. As we said earlier, he ain't done with this city. Our best days are not behind us. They are, in fact, still ahead of us. And there is revival coming to the city of St. Francis on our watch. And our family's doing fine. I think we're better than ever. My kids love Jesus. I think my wife loves me. <laughs> and the Father's house is great. We celebrated five years last week. 830 people have come to Jesus since we started five years ago. 345, what, 346 have been baptized in water. We had over 1,100 people show up to the house of God last week, lift up their voice and declare in faith what God was gonna do over our city. Things are okay. So no, sir, I don't receive your prophetic word because it's a pathetic word that does not align with the word of God over San Francisco. You may say we're hopeless and forsaken, but God says we're sought after, we're redeemed, we're the bride of God, we're holy. And we are a desirable place for a move of his spirit. And so are you. This is what God says over you as well. So what names do you need to stop responding to? And as you consider that question, let me offer one last thought in this conversation of identity. An asterisk, if you will. Something we need to remember that qualifies us for all we've said. If we're gonna lay hold of this new name, we must understand that our name comes on the heels of the acknowledgement of his name. We don't get to become who we are until we acknowledge who he is. One day Jesus is, is walking with his disciples and they're coming to Caesarea Philippi and he looks at his disciples and he asks a bit of an odd question. He's like, hey guys, um, who do people say that I am? What's the word on the street? What's the, the scuttlebug out there? What, what are people saying? 
<laughs> like 75 years old with that statement. No offense if you're 75 years old. Welcome. Love you. But uh, he asks his disciples this question, and one by one they begin to answer. They're like, well, you know, some people say you're, you're Elisha. Other people say you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Some are even saying that you're John the Baptist back from the dead. Jesus is like, all right, all right, all right. And then he flips the script on his disciples and he asks what I would consider to be one of the most important questions any of us are gonna have to answer on this side of eternity. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 15, Jesus asks this question and I'll invite the worship team to come as we prepare to close. He says this. He says, all right, that's what they say, but, but who do you say? Who, who do you think I am? Do you think one of the prophets or John the Baptist? That's what they're saying. What do you say about me? And Simon answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from anyone else, no human being. Now, now I say to you that you are Peter. Listen, listen. Jesus had a new name for Simon, a name that he had tucked away in his pocket. It was reserved for Simon at some point. His new name after this moment would be Peter. But, but this is a significant new name when you consider the name it replaced. Simon, well, based on historians telling us what this word means is, essentially a reed. It means a stick that's tossed and blown in the wind. But Jesus had plans for this reed. He knew that this reed would stand up on the day of Pentecost and preach the inaugural sermon that would give birth to the New Testament church where 3,000 people would be saved and baptized, leading to billions who would come to Christ. And we are sitting in this room as the result of a reed. He knew that that reed would walk through the streets of Galilee and even his shadow would fall on the sick and they would be healed. This reed would become one of the greatest of all the apostles, not just in his life, but also in his death, because that same reed would be executed as a martyr in the way that his Messiah was executed on a cross, only knowing he didn't want to compare himself to Jesus, he literally had them turn him upside down as he was crucified preaching to thousands, healing the sick, crucified up, upside down. These, these are not reed-like things. This is not something a, a frail stick blowing in the wind would do. And so Jesus says, we're gonna need to change that name. That's not who you are. Who you truly are is Peter, Petros, a name that means rock, steady, stable, steadfast, capable of carrying all that I am asking you to carry. You are no longer a reed, you are a rock, Peter. But take special note as to when his identity changed. It was not a, a result of his behavior. It wasn't, okay, Peter, now you're acting like a rock, so we're gonna go ahead and change your name. We're gonna make you a rock now. It's had nothing to do with him earning it. No, this new name came on the heels of his acknowledgement. It was after he recognized who Jesus was that Jesus was able to tell him who he was. Who do you say I am, Simon? I know that they're saying you're one of the prophets or John the Baptist, but let me tell you who I think you are. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, the one that was promised, the one we've been waiting for, the one who I can place all my trust and all my hope in knowing that they are safe in your hands. You are my savior. And Peter looks back and he says, blessed are you, Simon. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven revealed this to you. And now that you've acknowledged who I am, let me tell you who you are. I think this is the conversation a few people need to have with God today. As he came to Peter, he would come to you and he'd say, who do you say that I am? Maybe up until this moment, he's been a service you attend on a Sunday morning. Maybe he's been a, 
a historical figure. Maybe he's been a concept or an idea that you've considered, but he's not truly your Messiah, your Lord, the one that you've trusted your life to. Today's your day. Because listen, there's a new name hanging in the balance. There's a fresh identity on the other side of that acknowledgement. But he can't tell you who you are until you first acknowledge who he is. So as we conclude, I'm gonna make space for those who need to step into that acknowledgement. We bow our heads and we're gonna prepare to pray. And if you're here this morning and you'd say, Tim, I, 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 uh, I'm in that place. I, I know Jesus is talking to me. He's been a lot of things to me, but he has not been the one I've surrendered my life to. I need to give my life to Jesus this morning. I wanna pray a very simple prayer of commitment with you. As we do that, I ask every week if you'd be bold enough to tell me who you are, because I do pray for every single hand that goes up in this moment this, throughout the week. So I ask once again, if you need to pray that prayer with me today, would you be bold and quickly shoot up your hand and say, Tim, that's me. I'm praying that prayer and coming home to Jesus today. Got you. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Right on. Got you here, bro. Yeah, cool. Right over there. Hallelujah. If I missed you, I'm sorry. Oh, got you. Cool, right on. Thank you. All right, here's what we're going to do. All of us are going to pray out loud with those making this decision so they don't feel alone. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus, today I give you my life. I thank you for giving yours for mine. I choose to follow you. I say you are my Messiah. Forgive me of my sins and help me to be your disciple from this day forward until I see you in eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's celebrate with all we got. Every single one of those making that choice today.